Growing up as Africans, most of us unfortunately were never taught about the many great African leaders we have been blessed to have in our history. Leaders who raised it all for their people and even gave their lives. Leaders who were selfless and never stole from the people. It is very important that every African knows as much as possible about these great leaders and that is the point of this video. This video is in fact the second part of the key facts you need to know about this African leader series. In the first part which you can find in the description box or on the channel, the focus was placed on four of Africa's truly great and selfless leaders, Osage Fodota Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana, Thomas Noel Isidore Sankara of Burkina Faso, Egypt's Gamal Abdel Nasser, and Guinea's Ahmed Sekou Toure. This video is also dedicated to another four of Africa's equally great leaders, the DR Congo's Patrice Emery Lumumba, Tanzania's Julius Kambarage Nyerere, Libya's Muammar al-Gaddafi, and Mozambique's Samora Moises Machel. The first leader to be focused on is the man whose life was taken so early, but whose name and legacy can never be forgotten, the eternal Patrice Emery Lumumba of the Democratic Republic of Congo. Described by Malcolm X as the greatest African who ever walked the African continent, Lumumba was the independence leader of the DR Congo and the country's first prime minister. Now, did you know that in December 1958, almost two years before the DR Congo's independence in 1960, Lumumba attended the All-African People's Conference in Accra, Ghana. The international conference was hosted by Ghanaian leader Kwame Nkrumah and was attended by delegates from the independence movement in countries that were still under colonial rule, as well as delegates from the independent African states at the time. It was at this conference that Lumumba further solidified his Pan-Africanist beliefs and struck up a relationship with Kwame Nkrumah, who was personally impressed with Lumumba's intelligence and ability. The two leaders would go on to have a very close relationship till the end, with Nkrumah serving as a mentor to Lumumba. Lumumba knowing very well that the DR Congo, just like every other country in Africa, can only be free if all of Africa unites and stands together, signed a secret agreement with Kwame Nkrumah for a Ghana-Congo union. But this agreement was short-lived because Lumumba was assassinated very early on. So talking about the need for Africans to stand together, let me talk about the time Lumumba traveled across several African countries at the request of African heads of states. This was after his return from visiting the United Nations in New York at the height of the Congo crisis. First, Lumumba visited Tunisia where he met Tunisian President Habib Bourguiba who assured Lumumba that he was ready to help in any way possible. From Tunisia, Lumumba headed to Morocco after a special invitation from Kid Mohamed V who also assured Lumumba of his readiness to assist in any way possible. The Moroccan leader also made available a plane for Lumumba to fly back home. Patrice Lumumba then headed to Guinea, where he met Guinean President Sekou Toure and also found thousands of Guineans who were ready to volunteer to serve in the Congo. From Guinea, Lumumba went to Liberia, where he met the President William Tabman, who declared to Lumumba that Liberia is at your disposal and you will get everything you want. From Liberia, Lumumba visited Ghana, a country that already had their doctors, nurses and soldiers serving in the Congo. From Ghana, Lumumba finally went to Togo. He also received invitations from Egypt and Ethiopia, but did not have enough time to go everywhere. Lumumba on his return to the Congo described African solidarity as something unbelievable. In doing the research for this video, I was determined not to focus on the brutal assassination of the eternal Patrice Lumumba, but it is important that this next fact is highlighted. There were two other Congolese leaders who paid the ultimate price alongside Lumumba. The two men were Joseph Okito, who was a highly respected vice president of the Congolese Senate, and Maurice Impolo, the minister of youth and sports. The son of Maurice Impolo, Alfred Maurice Impolo, was taken to Ghana for safety. And later that year, Dennis Prosper Okito, the son of Joseph Okito, also moved to Ghana. The outrage felt at the news of Lumumba's murder was certainly not limited to the Congo, with protests breaking out in cities across the world. From New Delhi to New York to Paris to Cairo to Moscow to Shanghai to Accra to Belgrade and many more cities, massive protests were held as the peoples of the world showed their anger and outrage at the death of one of Africa's greatest leaders. To honor the great Congolese leader, the Soviet Union announced that the People's Friendship University in Moscow was going to be renamed the Patrice Lumumba University. So these are some important facts I believe every African must know about the eternal Patrice Emery Lumumba of the Democratic Republic of Congo. Next up is the great Pan-Africanist Libyan leader, Muammar Mohamed Abu Minya al-Gaddafi. 
This is the man whose revolution in 1969 caused the transformation of Libya from one of the poorest African countries to becoming the most prosperous African country. The very first fact every African needs to know about is the instrumental role Muammar Gaddafi played in ensuring that all of Africa had access to the use of telecommunication services. Now, many may not know this fact, but there was a time before the 2000s when Africa depended on Europe and America for its own communications. This made telephone calls made to others inside and outside of Africa the most expensive in the world. To stay on a phone call for five minutes was a luxury many Africans could not afford. But Muammar Gaddafi changed all this by agreeing to pay $300 million out of the total of $400 million that was needed for Africa to establish its own communication satellite. That satellite is known as the Regional African Satellite Communication Organization, the RASCOM. This amazing act by Gaddafi ensured that Africans everywhere could now communicate with others anywhere in the world at a very low cost and also browse the internet at a reduced price. Also, by agreeing to fund the RASCOM satellite, Gaddafi saved the continent from paying $500 million every year for using foreign satellites. So what else can be described as true Pan-Africanism, if not this act by Muammar Gaddafi of Libya? A true revolutionary as Muammar Gaddafi was, the task of transforming the lives of the Libyan people, many of whom were deprived of the basic necessities of life, was his highest priority. Can Gaddafi guarantee the rights of all Libyan people to access the basic needs of life? Every Libyan citizen had access to free quality health care, education was also made free at all levels, and housing was a guaranteed human rights with Gaddafi ensuring that all Libyans had a roof over their heads. The great Libyan leader was able to make all this possible by ensuring that the majority of all revenue from Libya's oil came to the state rather than private corporations. So it is this oil money that he used to provide the free healthcare and education Libyans enjoyed and also ensure that homelessness was eradicated in Libya. Colonel Muammar Gaddafi also constructed the world's largest irrigation project in Libya. This project which Gaddafi described as the eighth wonder of the world turned barren regions of Libya into the breadbasket. The $33 billion project was fully funded by Libya's state-owned bank without any foreign aid. During South Africa's long struggle for freedom from apartheid, one of the most committed supporters of the liberation forces that were fighting to end apartheid was Muammar Gaddafi. Indeed, just three months after the release of the great South African leader Nelson Mandela from prison, he traveled to Libya as the leader of the ANC to visit Gaddafi. In response to those who criticized his decision to visit Gaddafi, Mandela declared that, our moral authority dictate that we should not abandon those who helped us in the darkest hour in the history of this country. Not only did Libya support us, they gave us the resources for us to conduct our struggle and to win. And those South Africans who have berated me for being loyal to our friends, literally, they can go and throw themselves into a pool. Wow, such strong words from the great Nelson Mandela to show just how much he and other freedom fighters appreciated the unconditional help Muammar Gaddafi gave them throughout the struggle against apartheid. It is through concrete actions like this that Muammar Gaddafi proved himself to be one of the greatest Pan-African leaders in history. And all Africans must do well to always remember his great sacrifices for the continent and people of Africa and seek to emulate him. The next truly great African leader we are going to focus on is the man who is most affectionately referred to as the Mualimu, which means the teacher, Julius Kambarage Nyerere, the first president of Tanzania. Mwalimu Nyerere was a true anti-colonialist leader and a pan-Africanist. Julius Nyerere was first elected a prime minister in 1960 of the country that was then known as Tanganyika. And following the Zanzibar Revolution of 1964, Mwalimu Nyerere successfully ensured the unification of the island of Zanzibar with Tanganyika to form Tanzania. As a believer in pan-Africanism as he was, Julius Nyerere worked tirelessly to create an East African federation with Uganda and Kenya. In fact, the Mualimu was willing to delay the independence of Tanganyika to ensure that this unification was possible, but his efforts were ultimately unsuccessful. Despite being a Pan-Africanist, Mualimu Nyerere had a fundamental difference with other Pan-Africanists like Ghanes Kwame Nkrumah, who believed that all of Africa must be united as soon as possible. Mualimu Nyerere believed differently, saying that the continental unity of Africa must happen in stages, with the various regions of Africa uniting first. But Mualimu Nyerere many years later recognized that the position of Kwame Nkrumah was the right one. And this was made clear in a speech Mualimu Nyerere made in Accra on the 6th of March 1997, titled, Without Unity, There is No Future for Africa. 
In that speech, Mualimu Nyerere admitted that the first generation of African leaders did not pursue the objective of African unity with the vigor, commitment and sincerity that it deserved. This speech by Julius Nyerere is one that every African needs to read and the link to it can be found in the description box of this video. The reason I say every African must read this speech is because the speech contains many solid reasons for why all of us as Africans must either unite or perish, as Kwame Nkrumah used to say. Mwali Nyerere was a diehard supporter of African liberation and welcomed African freedom fighters into Tanzania in the 1960s and 70s. Indeed, Julius Nyerere was the chairman of the Frontline States, which was a loose coalition of African countries from the 1960s to the early 1990s that was committed to ending apartheid and white minority rule in South Africa and Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe. The frontline states led by Nyerere provided asylum and supported groups and individuals fighting colonialism across Africa, including South Africa's African National Congress and the Pan-Africanist Congress. Due to these selfless acts by the frontline states, they became targets of destabilization and attacks by the apartheid rulers, but this did not deter them. Julius Nyerere and Tanzania played a significant role in assisting the liberation forces of Mozambique and Zimbabwe to achieve independence in their respective countries. As he was working hard to liberate other African countries from colonialism, Nyerere also worked to massively improve the lives of the Tanzanian people by ensuring that healthcare and education was accessible to all. In ending, here is a quote by the great Julius Kambarage Nyerere for all Africans to think about. Africa must travel together as one or no part of it will arrive at its destination. The fourth truly great African leader we are going to shine a light on is the revolutionary leader and first president of Mozambique, Samora Moises Machel. Samora Machel is the man who led the Mozambican people to achieve independence by defeating the Portuguese colonialists in 1975. After his country attained independence, Samora Machel gave massive support to revolutionaries fighting colonial rule, especially those who were fighting white minority regimes in Rhodesia and South Africa. These African freedom fighters were allowed to train and seek refuge in Mozambique. Samora, after Mozambique's independence, joined the frontline states alongside Julius Nyerere, Kenneth Kaunda and others to ensure that all of Africa was liberated from colonial rule. This act of solidarity by Samora came at a great cost as the colonial regimes in Rhodesia and South Africa created an armed and opposition to Marshall's government in order to destabilize Mozambique through violence. So for those who may not be aware, this great son of Africa was killed in 1986 when his plane crashed in South Africa. The cause of the crash remains a mystery till this day, but there are many who believe that the apartheid government of South Africa then was behind it. This is due to the fact that Samora posed a great threat to their oppressive rule. Across many African countries, Samora Marshall has been immortalized by having public places and infrastructure named after him. From the Samora Marshall Stadium in Iringa, Tanzania, to the Samora Marshall Avenue in Harare, to the Samora Marshall Street in Abuja, to the Samora Marshall Road in Ghana and many more elsewhere. Also, in celebration of the eternal greatness of Samora Marshall, the legendary South African singer Miriam Makeba made a song titled Aluta Continua, which means the struggle continues, and this song was dedicated to Samora Marshall and his party, the Frelimo. Aluta Continua was the slogan Samora used to signify the fact that the struggle against colonialism was not over until all of Africa was liberated. So here are a few more facts about Samora Marshall. In one of his first acts as president, he nationalized all the land in Mozambique in order to return lands that had been forcibly taken by Portuguese settler colonialists back to Mozambicans. Samora and his government also worked to ensure that all Mozambicans, regardless of their class or positions in society, had access to decent housing, good health care, and quality education. All this was achieved despite being a newly independent country that was under attack from colonial powers. So in ending, let me share with you two similarities I recognize that cuts across all eight truly great African leaders that have been focused on so far in this series. The first has to be how quickly each of them moved to ensure that their people were provided with the basic necessities of life. Virtually all of these leaders ensured that all their people, regardless of their class, tribe or religion, had access to healthcare, education, water, food and decent housing. The second observation I made is the strong Pan-African spirit all these leaders embodied. Each one of them knew and understood that the independence of their various countries is meaningless until it is linked up with the total liberation of the African continent. In actual fact, there's a third and last observation I must add, and this is the selfless nature of each of these leaders. Virtually all of them left power without looting from the public office or enriching themselves at the expense of the people. It is my hope and prayer that this video will inspire you and contribute in any way possible to the struggle to ensure Africa's progress.
please do not forget to hit the subscribe button and like the video thank you so much for watching